Uh, this is the Building Peace for Democracy, Strengthening Democracy for Peace session. And we are thrilled that you are with us today. You're going to hear from fantastic representatives of two organizations, Urban Rural Action and Lead for America. And you can see the presenters up on the screen. Um, we have Joe Nail, uh, CEO and co-founder of Lead for America. Uh, Nicole Vera, VP of Programs from Lead for America. Carlin Thompson, uh, Senior Program Manager from Lead for America. Shanae Simon and Logan Grubb, Program Directors from Urban Rural Action. And what we'll be covering during this session is, are the intersections of peace and democracy in the US, the importance of ideological diversity and efforts to strengthen our democracy, um, practical nonpartisan interventions that can strengthen our democracy and civic health, and actions that you can take to strengthen our democracy. And I would just like to once again invite you to introduce, you in this, introduce yourself in the chat, share why you're here, why you decided to join our, our session. And I'm just going to offer sort of a two minute preamble to set the context for this discussion. Um, and then we will jump right in. So when we think about conflict globally, we know that weak governance is a primary cause and effect of violent conflict, right? So, which is to say um, societies where governing institutions are not able to meet the basic needs of their citizens, where people feel like they don't have a voice, where they can't affect change, where there is widespread corruption, where dissent is stifled, those dynamics fuel anger and injustice. And that often contributes to participation in violence. And that level of insecurity makes it harder to govern. Um, and that level of insecurity where governing institutions can't provide basic peace and order and security contributes to a loss of trust in institutions. It erodes the legitimacy of governing institutions. And it also creates a vacuum for armed groups to exploit. And when armed groups have to provide uh, basic security to community members, um, it makes it that much harder for governing institutions to fulfill uh, their role. And so it contributes to weaker governance. And the flip side is true, right? Stronger governance where people's basic needs are met contributes to more peaceful societies, more peaceful societies where people can resolve their differences collaboratively leads to uh, better governance and better political systems. Which brings us to the United States. And when we talk about governance in the United States, we're talking about democracy. It's the essence of who we are as a country and what we aspire to be. And while from the very birth of our democracy, we have experienced egregious shortcomings based on who has been able to participate in our democracy and who has not, who has been excluded, we have nevertheless made tremendous strides over many decades, progress towards a more inclusive, more multiracial democracy. And yet today, I would argue that our democracy is in decline and that political violence is on the rise and absent some concerted action, we're likely to see a further erosion of our democracy and an increase in political violence. But this is not a doom and gloom panel, uh, nor is it a panel of DC based academics opining on the reforms that are needed to strengthen our democracy. This is a panel of terrific Americans who are on the front lines of building bridges across divides to strengthen our democracy. And it's a tremendous honor uh, to be alongside Shanae, Carlin, Logan, Joe, and Nicole, um, representing again, two different organizations, Urban Rural Action and Lead for America. And I'll quickly say that Shanae is in Memphis, Carlin is in Phoenix, Logan is in Hummelstown, Pennsylvania, Joe is in Dodge City, Kansas, and Nicole is in outside of the DC area in Virginia. Um, we won't hold that against you, Nicole. Um, so just to provide a sense of the structure for this discussion, I'm going to ask uh, questions of our panelists, but I'm also going to be scanning uh, the room chat, which I have open in front of me, and I will integrate your questions as we go. So please do chime in with your questions for Shanae, Carlin, Logan, Joe, and Nicole, who will be talking about a program called Uniting for Democracy, um, which is a national grassroots program led by young people, Lead for America fellows who reflect the communities where they live and the country um, where they live. 
working in underserved urban areas, rural areas, and tribal lands in partnership with host organizations and community members to address local democracy challenges. So um, with that, um, let me go to uh, our first question of the session. And again, I'll be scanning the chat for your questions. Um, but Shanae, let's go to you first and let's talk about the why of this program, uh, meaning the Uniting for Democracy program. The conference theme is rising to the challenges of a disrupted world. And the United States is experiencing those disruptions as well. I shared my thoughts on the intersections of peace and democracy, but I'm curious if you could share your thoughts. In other words, how does a more peaceful society contribute to a stronger democracy in the US? And how does a more inclusive multiracial democracy contribute to peace in our country? Thank you, Joe, and welcome to everyone that's here with us. And I have to say, I'm just like really energized um, just by the energy in the room. Those are present from around the world. So just thank you all for joining us today. And this completely, um, you become now ambassadors for this work for Uniting for Democracy across the U.S. And so when you pose that question just about the program um, in terms of why now, like if not now, then when? I think for four, it's far too long within our country. We've kept saying, hey, we have these problems that we need to address, but there's been limited programs or exclusive programs that have been really kind of catered to the majority that are included in that conversation. And it's been happening for far too long. And so now is the right time to include different voices, different perspectives, different backgrounds, different ethnicities, just differences, right? Um, I think the beauty of this program is it's inclusive of differences. And when we look at our democracy, you know, when I think when we talk about um, democracy, I think the word that comes to mind for me is a new democracy, a new America, like a new agenda. That I think that we have to think beyond trying to repair what's been there, but really transforming and rising to the occasion of where we are as a country, where we are as a world, and meeting the demands head on. And I think beyond looking at just kind of multiracial, it's multidimensional. And so many areas because we need to think beyond race. It needs to be ethnicities. It needs to be cultures. It needs to be gender. It needs to be abilities. I mean, the full array of differences need to be included in the democracy. I think when that also often, I think in my research and my work that you hear when you mentioned so eloquently in your opening, Joe, just about violence, that, you know, inciting violence is kind of what the terminology here. And when you hear about peace, we really don't have like a power word before peace beyond just kind of building bridges, which is great. So in my mind today, I said, well, we say incite violence. Violence, and I'm saying let's infuse peace, right? Yeah. Let's have this infusion of peace where we are really passionate about it and we're infusing this in the way that we think and the way that we work and the way that we build. And that peace sometimes um, has like not, not as strong as a presence as violence, right? But how do we counter that and put the power behind peace and how much it is needed and how, how great it is to partner with an organization like LFA with young leaders that are getting this new terminology now as opposed to waiting until years later to kind of say, oh, wow, like this is new, but now not only am I new at participant, but I'm new in creating something new and something different. And I love how you mentioned earlier, Joe, about not just peace, but also security and how peace and security are both in democracy, are these issues of national security. When we think about national security and the threat of national security, it's coming from disruptions of peace, it's coming from disruptions of communities, it's coming from a disruption of, of risk security. And I think it's so important that we continue to lead and build on what is peace, what is safe and what is secure for all and really centering the human being and the human spirit and knowing that every human voice, every human perspective should be included to build peace and also to strengthen our democracy. Wow, thank you for that energetic and inspiring opening, Shanae, and the call for us not just to repair what's broken, but to imagine a new America, a new democracy where everyone has a voice and where regardless of your ethnicity, religion, racial identity, you have an opportunity to contribute in the way everyone else can. And I love that language of infusing peace, right? Framing matters. And you talked about the energy you felt today when you came to this room. We're hoping to be inspired by and inspire all of you who are with us today. So thank you for uh, that infused peace language. Joe, let me go to you next. Uh, when you think about your vision for a strong democracy, what are the ways in which we're falling short? Uh, Shanae articulated some of these, right? The ways that we have too long excluded people from underrepresented and marginalized communities. Um, so I'm wondering what are some of the dynamics that worry you and as the co-founder and CEO of Lead for America, what are some of the ways that your organization is trying to address those dynamics? 
Yeah, thank you so much for having us, Joe, and for the question. Um, I think that, you know, obviously there's all sorts of different ways you could go with this. You could talk about, uh, you know, specifically the leadership capacity and who are the people and what are the experiences that those that those leaders have and um, are we doing a good enough job of really getting, um, you know, our nation's most outstanding people to be in positions of public responsibility? That's certainly one factor. I think you could talk about the structural problems. You could talk about, um, you know, what is the role of money in politics or what are the laws that we have on the books uh, in terms of uh, just how elections are, are run um, or uh, any sort of electoral reforms um, and, and certainly structural or um, uh, kind of law based uh, democracy reform is something that's worth talking about. But something that I've been thinking a lot, a lot more about recently um, and that I think kind of dovetails on uh, what Shanae was sharing is uh, it seems increasingly that we don't really have um, a common set of visions, a common vision or set of aspirations for the country as a whole. And so you can do all of these other things. You can, you know, focus on building programs like ours that build a pipeline of folks into positions of leadership. Um, you can, you know, you know, talk about or, uh, you know, actually change some of the, the key parts of the democratic process to try to get more people involved. Um, and you can celebrate, for example, getting people who have traditionally been excluded uh, from our democracy getting, uh, getting engaged. Um, but if you don't, at the end of the day, have a common aspiration or vision for what you're actually working towards, how are you possibly going to have progress? And how are you, even if you're making progress as one side may define it, um, how are you actually going to have a strong and cohesive country? And I think one of the things that concerns me um, is that uh, usually when people talk about the transition that America is making to being, you know, majority minority by the middle of the century, um, or when they talk about uh, the shortcomings of our democracy, it's a lot easier uh, to talk about the shortcomings and just to prioritize inclusion um, without recognizing um, that if we're going to actually move towards this vision, we need to have a, a, a big tent vision that everyone can get actually excited about and behind. And so um, what I see within our organization, what I've seen on the ground is that increasingly when I'm in you know, right leaning or conservative circles, um, there's a certain language that's being used about the country and what we're aspiring to. And that's usually a restoration of the principles of the founding. Um, and it's not at all, I, I rarely would hear anyone talk about wanting it to be a majority white country or anything like that, but still they're talking about restoring the founding principles. When I'm in left leaning spaces, it's almost always the emphasis on we want to be a multiracial democracy uh, that looks fundamentally different and atones for the sins or mistakes of the past. Um, and so I think what we have to actually recognize is that instead of just kind of glossing over those differences and acting like we're all just going to be able to have it be compatible, there has to be a fundamental national conversation. And I think the upcoming 250th anniversary of the country is a great time to have that conversation about how can we actually reconcile these pretty significant differences where, yes, in order for our country to be cohesive, we have to have a common narrative. We have to have some founding myths. We have to hold on and be grateful for uh, the foundations that have led us to where we are today. And also at the same time, of course, we can do better. And so I think that's the big thing. Like you would never start an organization, whether it's you are action or lead for America or anything else without a vision statement, without a mission statement. What is actually the vision statement or mission statement for our country? And how can you get to a place where it's not going to be 100 percent of Americans who may be enthusiastic, but you at least have you know, a huge majority or plurality. I've yet to see a vision or a mission statement articulated for our country that I think brings people together across lines of difference. Joe, thank you for, for laying that out so compellingly. Um, what I hear from you is that we, across the ideological spectrum, we have these different visions for our country, whether it's a more inclusive, more multiracial democracy that elevates voices that have been uh, left out of conversations for too long, or one that's really about restoring the constitutional principles of our of our founding. And the need to um, create a big tent that enables us to have these conversations about the America we want to live in and how we can align around a common vision for our future. So thanks for articulating that really profoundly. And I'll, I'll just take a moment to add that what you and Shanae have in common is that you and or your families are serving our country in the armed forces. And um, I just wanna honor that you are demonstrating the ways that you can serve our country in many different ways, um, both in uh, armed service and also through bringing people together across divides to strengthen our country, um, through dialogue, through democracy strengthening, through peace building. So thank you both. Carlin, let me go to you next. Uh, you talked about Sorry, you heard Joe talk about the 250th, uh, 250 year anniversary of the founding of our country and uh, the, the timing of 
facilitating conversation about the, the vision for our country. Let's sort of transition from that challenge to the Uniting for Democracy program. And maybe you can talk a little bit about um, how the program aims to address some of the dynamics and, and challenges that we heard from both Joe and Jeanette. Absolutely. And thank you all for being able to articulate these visions so well. I'm amongst some of my fave people. So thank you. Um, I, I definitely think one of the things that I'm most excited about for the United for Democracy program and a, and a lot of the things that come up in my role as a senior program manager at LFA is, is focused on the fellows that we support. Um, and so one of the really incredible things that this program is doing is um, adding on to what we um, historically have asked our fellows to do, which is go to your communities. They're serving in nonprofits, in local governments, um, in civic minded um, for profits in some cases uh, where they're helping push forward a local challenge that is um, identified specifically there. And I know Joe mentioned um, these are locally rooted young leaders who are excited about this new vision. And I think we do this often. We're having a lot of conversations internally, at least with these young folks, about what is the vision that we're trying to accomplish. Um, and so how we help the fellows uh, figure that out in their local community as well is asking them to go on a listening tour, asking them to hear from their community members, to invite people to be civically engaged with the challenges that they're um, listening to. And as they gather that, I know we have a lot of young people are ripe for action. <laughs> a lot less talking is where I feel like a, young, a lot of young people are and a lot more like, what can we do? Um, which is has its pros and cons. Um, and what I think we are able to tackle through the Uniting for Democracy um, or program is to be able to give these fellows that um, container, that space um, for them to be able to cha uh, tackle the things that they're see hearing from their community members um, alongside their community members and also be empowered to uh, see what that could look like. So I'm going to see, I know this is, I'm going to pull up our... Um, presentation again, just so that you can see really quickly when we talk about where our fellows are serving, um, these all these yellow dots are representative of humans who are dedicated to tackling their challenges. And so I like to show that just so that you can see where a representation of where our fellows are coming from. They're, they're thinking about a lot of different um, local challenges that end up being very similar on a national scale, but the way that you can tackle them are, of course, very different in their local communities. So um, the United for Democracy program is allowing that container, one, to bring these fellows together to support one another and empower one another to help lead the momentum to tackling these challenges and also giving the tools to the fellows and their community members for us to be able to do so. So um, I will stop sharing the presentation, but um, hopefully, Joe, that helps get to that uh, to the question that you're asking, and especially I think what Joe, um, our Joe um, at LFA also um, is sharing is that our fellows are doing this bridge building work on a day to day basis. Um, they're restoring a lot of trust that has been broken in their communities just by showing up, being there, listening and giving people the platform to voice how they are feeling. Um, and that's a lot of work and they do it very diligently and um, and have this new program to help push forward the action that they also really are, are yearning for um, in their local communities as well. Thanks so much, Carlin. And what you've talked about is the way in which Lead for America fellows are spearheading democratic participation through this program. And again, this is a program that is implemented jointly by Lead for America and Urban Rural Action. So Logan, tell us a little bit about what your action is contributing to this program and what are some of the outcomes that you're hoping to achieve through uh, this program? Yeah, Joe, thanks so much for the question. Um, grateful to be part of this panel today. And also, I just want to uh, thank again, the Alliance for Peace Building um, and USIP for their hard work in organizing this conference. Um, it's certainly been a really informative last few days for me. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think is the strongest thing that your action brings to the Uniting for Democracy program, simply put, is, is the diversity of experiences. So the your action core team members, you know, they're civic strategists, facilitators, community organizers, change agents, veterans, mediators, conflict managers, and peace builders. And being able to draw on these experiences and the different spaces that each of us occupies, um, I think is certainly made for a more robust and adaptable program. You know, on a more technical level, 
I think that your action is also able to help facilitate the, the, the difficult conversations that inevitably arise um, when discussing problems with democracy with a little d, um, using our ABCs for constructive dialogues across difference. Um, I think this, this memorable acronym model provides a framework for helping people to achieve a shared understanding of different views um, while also being able to build connections throughout that process. We also help people deepen their understandings of the causes and effects of complex societal problems by leading them through what we call problem tree analyses. Um, and then we also, you know, finally, the, the last piece of this process is helping folks implement achievable solutions through a project design process, which we certainly hope aligns groups on a clear path for affecting change in their communities through joint action. You know, to your second question, I think one of the outcomes that I'm most hoping to achieve is for folks, particularly those in non-traditional seats of power, to see that affecting change and participating in American democracy can and should be possible, probable, and powerful. And as a recent graduate, I'd be lying if I said I'm not interested in seeing the success of these young people, these fellows, um, being empowered to enact change in their communities. Thanks, Logan. And so let's talk about those fellows a little bit. I'm going to go to Nicole, but you're the same age as the, the Lead for America fellows who are spearheading democratic participation in this program. And Nicole, as we've talked about, these are fellows who come from underrepresented communities, whether they're um, underserved urban areas, rural areas, tribal lands. Tell us a little bit about the cohort and why it's so important that they play a leading role in this Uniting for Democracy program. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and thanks for the question. Um, well, first and foremost, our fellows are really what we see as the next generation of civic leaders. Um, and um, and and doing so, they're also, uh, we look for folks who are committed to place, uh, meaning that they're either committed to returning um, home or, or staying in their hometowns. And so um, we, by um, by this idea of serving and building, we have this idea and vision of having them serve and build bridges in the places that they call home. So we really are are, are committed to place. And so um, I think that's a really key and interesting part of our program, which is uh, this hometown connection. Um, who are our fellows and, and what, are, what are they doing? So I just wanna kind of give some examples of what some of our fellows have been able to do and what some of our current fellows are actually are doing right now. Um, so we have one fellow who's been a phenomenal fellow who's actually a board member for us now. Um, her name is Shandine Herrera and she was um, from Monument Valley, placed in Monument Valley, Utah. And um, during, um, during her fellowship, she was one of three women who was able to establish really a chapter wide uh, care network in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so uh, she and, and this group were responsible for distributing care packages to literally thousands of families um, and raised like over $18 million um, in emergency community needs. And so um, it's just one example of, this was Shandine's community venture project that Carolyn had mentioned. Um, and just a really phenomenal fellow that we had um, go through the program and who's now an alum. Um, some of the fellows that we have now are also working on very specific um, kind of um, issue areas such as um, emergency broadband um, benefits and um, just broadband access overall, especially in kind of rural and underserved areas. Um, so one story I heard recently um, was we have a, a fellow in Oregon, um, Sam Goodwin, who was um, it, you know, and, and this, you know, you kind of have to celebrate sometimes the little wins, like th this kind of smaller win that just kind of made me happy was to hear that um, Sam was, uh, and keep in mind, this is, you know, like a, a, a young 20 something year old, uh, was able to get approval from kind of the local utility um, office to include information about how um, constituents can um, access this emergency broadband benefit. And so that is now being communicated out to 18,000 people in their community. And so that reach is just so profound that one fellow was able to do. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you can like imagine the kind of hoops that were, you know, needed to kind of jump through just to kind of work with a, a public utility to get something what you would think is so simple as, you know, information included on a utility bill. But, um, 
but yeah, like that, that's kind of the, the, the systems that we have to work through and um, we have to celebrate those wins. So from the, the Sean Deans of the world who've kind of, you know, done and, and created this huge community ventures and, and, and the Sam Goodwins of the world who've impacted thousands of, of community members and who I'm sure will continue in, in their own community venture project to do even more. Um, just wanted to give like a sampling of just kind of the amazing fellows that we, that we have going through our program just to give also some just kind of, you know, just uh, 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 I guess a, a vision of, of what, um, or, you know, paint the picture of who our fellows are further, um, our, of our current cohort. So we have about 90 some fellows um, currently in service to us, service with us. Um, we have roughly a little less than half um, are people of color, um, a little more than half um, are um, identified as female. And then roughly a little more than 30% or so are uh, first generation college students. Um, so these are the these are the folks who kind of make up our program. And, um, and um, I mentioned this commitment um, to place and to hometown. It would be remiss also to, to um, fail to mention that our, our fellows are also committed to service. And I think service um, is a profound and impactful tool when it comes to peace building. Uh, and so I'm sure we'll talk, we'll talk more about service, but I just wanted to, to plug the service, the service piece and all of that. Thanks for plugging the service piece, Nicole, and also for sharing the really powerful examples of impact that Shandine and Sam are leading. Um, through the Lead for America Fellowship Program. And Shanae, that makes me think of you because you're a big believer in celebrating the wins that Nicole described and also using narrative and storytelling as a vehicle for bringing people together. Did you want to say a word more about that? Thank you for bringing that back and thank you all for everyone sharing. Yeah, I wanted to just amplify or uplift what um, Carlin and both Joe um, from LFA mentioned earlier about the inclusion of different perspectives. And as we look at the anniversary of our country, of how important this time is to have inclusive narratives. And I think the power of the LFA Uniting for Democracy program is allowing these young leaders to have their voice and that they're leading these conversations with their voices. They're gathering the voices of folks in their communities and they're able to write that new narrative. And now to uplift that narrative with their fellows across the country, as Nicole mentioned, 90 individuals are now creating new streams of narrative that help shape the celebration of the 250th anniversary of our country, but also just to how important that is that, you know, that people are able to tell their own stories and not just tell them, but also to write them, to have metrics, to have data, because for so long, the stories have been told by narrators and not those that are serving and not those that are acting. And so I think there's so much power in the work that LFA is doing, the work that URA is doing, this collaboration, that we're able to collect these stories and to have these stories to kind of fuel what's to come and to create what's to come with these new visions and perspectives and experiences. Thanks so much, Shanae. And of course, those stories of impact flow from implementation of this program. And so I want us to get a little more granular about the mechanics of how this all works. And Carlin, I'm going to turn to you for a second as we begin to talk in more detail about what this program looks like. And as you, as everyone in the room uh, listens to what Carlin, Shanae, Logan, Nicole, and Joe have to say about this program, again, we'll invite you to chime in in the chat with, with your questions. Um, Carlin, the, the fellows are, of course, leading implementation of this program, but they're working side by side with partner organizations as well as other members of their community who may have different perspectives, diff different lived experiences, might um, be from different age groups. And my question for you is, how exactly um, will this all work? How will they be working? How will the Lead for America fellows be working with members of their community and their partner organizations? Absolutely. Yeah, they the oh, one thing that I was saying, I'm going to pull up the slides again, just so that we can see the the goals for our program um, for those who are joining us. Let me make sure I navigate to the right slide. Um, one thing that I think both Logan had mentioned earlier and, and maybe others as well is just one, the skill building aspect. Um, that's one of the biggest ways that I know that the fellows not only themselves have received this training from your action and, and have had remarkable reviews about how that has helped them to be able to move uh, forward with conversations of constructive dialogue with these people that they're trying to get to participate in this program even um, and 
Uh, Logan mentioned earlier using things like the ABCs model, the problem tree analysis. So, so actual um, tools are being given both to the fellows and to the community members as well. Um, and to get into the nitty gritty of the program, the fellows are re currently recruiting about five to eight other community members, either in their local community. So we have some in very rural communities of maybe thousands of people um, trying to get people across divides, um, across differences um, from a very representative uh, background for, for their community, especially um, to be able to help participate in this program. Um, and that all is nestled with the support um, and the power of a, a local institution that is nestled in that local community and able to also see the hopes and desires of being able to have constructive dialogue to work towards the local democracy challenges that are happening in their, their community um, and also help push forward the, the work of the fellow. Um, so the fellows are, are recruiting these five to eight members, will be joining either virtually or in person to be able to give these tools to each community that we have, hear from each community about what types of challenges they are facing, and then figure out ways using those tools to um, tackle those local challenges. So as we've mentioned before, fellows are tasked historically with implementing a community venture process their own inside of their service as well. I'm gonna stop um, sharing my screen. Um, and they have been they have been doing that over the last few years in our um, organization, but oftentimes alone. And so one of the things that I think is most powerful of the Uniting for Democracy program is that they will have buy in collective buy in from others that, of course, we encourage to to uh, fellows to find in their community venture process. Um, but oftentimes gets hard to have commitment from. And so one of the biggest things I think I'm also excited to see, this is one of the first times in LFA's history that we've been able to provide the platform for the community members to connect with one another across the nation. Um, our fellows get that opportunity often to network with one another, to represent their communities. Um, but th this time the fellows will have the opportunity to, to bring their community members along. And so in the last, um, about year or, or uh, their final uh, part portion of their fellowship, they'll be able to implement some of the things that come up that are, um, for their local democracy challenges. So some of those might be tackling misinformation, um, working either alongside some of the local news channels. And I, I know I'll probably let Logan speak a little bit about how these options can look, um, but through both moderated um, sessions with your action and, uh, and support of giving the tools to the people in, our, in the communities that need to use them. Um, and then also being able to help bring these groups together, have them connect with one another, share best practices, share what's happening in their local communities, and then be able to implement action, um, be able to get to that point of getting past dialogue as well, and being able to start seeing some of the changes uh, that they would like to see in their communities. Thanks, Carlin. Super helpful because democracy can be a fuzzy word. And what I heard you talk about is addressing local democracy challenges like misinformation, news deserts. And Logan, let me go to you to provide some additional examples to bring this to life. What types of local democracy interventions do you anticipate that fellows and the members of their community who they recruit would implement in Uniting for Democracy? Yeah, Joe, thanks so much for the question. Um, I think building on what Carla had just shared, you know, some of the things that fellows have mentioned as the democratic issues they're interested in tackling, you know, are distrust in institutions, misinformation. I know one fellow had mentioned incorporating arts and culture into democratic participation. And I think that one of the things we're, we're really consciously trying to do when we develop this program is not um, impose a model on to the fellows, right? We want that the each of the groups who are working on these democratic issues in their local communities to, pro to provide unique solutions that are best going to suit, you know, the confines that they're working under, the skills that they have, the resources that they have. Um, and so I think that it really can, can run the gamut in terms of what this looks like. So I know Nicole had mentioned, um, you know, these little wins about raising funds for uh, you know, being able to pass out resources during the pandemic or letting constituents know how to access broadband. I think there could also be, you know, sharing informational pamphlets about 
how to be a, an informed kind of constituent, what it means to be able to um, look through a news article and say, is this a credible source? Are they citing their sources? You know, how can I discern, you know, wh what does it mean to be, you know, news literate? I think it could be something that's involved in, you know, having a, a a drive, a voter drive, you know, like things that are, are reaching communities who, you know, maybe have historically not been able to vote or not been able to register to vote. Um, and I think that th those are just a few of the examples, but I would say that they really um, can be unique. And I'm interested to see as we begin to ramp up this program, um, how those will begin to develop, you know, over the courses of our conversations with the fellows and obviously the people that they're bringing along with them, you know, on this journey. Joe, I think you're muted. Okay, I'm no longer muted. Um, I, I did not mute myself, but um, maybe someone didn't like what I had said previously, but I'm glad to be back. Logan, thanks for sharing uh, the fact that, you know, the autonomy that people in this program have to design their own interventions and address challenges that they see in their communities. And Joe, I wanna to go to you next because part of what we just heard from Logan is that the process is as important as the product, which is to say that the process of engaging with our differences and confronting, grappling with different perspectives on the state of our democracy is as important as the ultimate outputs of an intervention and just coming together across divides, ideological and other divides to engage with difference rather than shut them out um, is as important as what ultimately the group does together. And it makes me think back to what you said at the outset, that we might have different views, not just of our democracy as it is today, but different views of what our democracy ought to be. And we need to engage with those different perspectives. And part of what this program aims to do is to equip people with the skills to embrace curiosity, ask open-ended questions, engage with different views, even if we don't agree with them. And so I'm just wondering why you see ideological bridge building as so important, not just for this program, but for the work that Lead for America does and why it's so important that each group of community members represent the ideological diversity of the communities and the country where they live. Yeah, well, uh, this is maybe a statement that others on on this panel or uh, that are listening in would disagree with. But I think that it's critical because the ideological differences that we have in America, in my view, are the biggest fault line that we have in American life today. And um, there's all sorts of research that's been done and published even in the past year on this. But used to just cite one, the Center for Politics at the University of Virginia released a study basically doing surveying of the entire country. Um, and found that 75% each of uh, supporters of Biden and Trump saw strong supporters of the opposing party as a clear, quote, a clear and present danger to American democracy. And as much as either side may, uh, or you know, across race, gender, class, et cetera, there may be uh, differences or even animosity, um, you would never find um, that sort of uh, statistic of, again, three quarters of a group um, you know, saying that they see uh, outsiders or people from a different group uh, being a clear and present danger to American democracy. And um, in terms of how this relates down to the local level as well, um, you know, uh, Alexei de Tocqueville in his, um, you know, book, Democracy in America, when he came to the United States and tried to understand as a, you know, someone from the outside looking in as a French aristocrat, what was it that allowed the United States uh, to succeed um, when on the outside, it seems so improbable. And what he wrote was that municipal institutions um, are the primary schools of democracy. And um, he, he talked about how, uh, you know, part of what allows us to function on a, a state or a federal level um, is the fact that we're basically flexing these muscles of civic engagement um, by showing up and, and holding positions within our own neighborhoods, our own, our own communities. And I think that, um, you know, I talked about earlier this lack of a cohesive vision statement or mission statement for the country that can pull people together. Well, before you're ever going to get to a place where people can engage in good faith, either at a community level, let alone on a national level, you have to have fundamentally some shared trust and shared experiences. And whether you're talking about geographic sorting across lines of ideology, 
um, or just the sorting uh, virtually and in terms of what sort of spaces people or where people go in terms of institutions of higher education or employment or whatever else. I think what we see increasingly is people surrounding themselves with people who really disagree with them um, and then, uh, you know, being quite dismissive of people who they disagree with and only seeing um, literally the sentiments that they may have that they most uh, disagree with as opposed to actually coming to know someone in terms of their family or their background or what are the reasons um, that have led them to whatever their beliefs are. You mentioned earlier that I uh, serve in the, um, in the uh, armed forces in the US Army National Guard. And when you're at boot camp or you're in a foxhole, like nobody's asking um, about your partisan or political affiliation. Nobody, nobody really cares if you're an R or a D or anything like that. Um, it's fundamentally about whether um, you know, you're a decent person who uh, is, is gonna have your back in this really difficult uh, situation or circumstance. circumstance. And so, that's what I'm really advocating for is um, I think there has to be that broader national conversation about what are we actually aspiring to. But I think where interventions and programs like Lead for America or like Uniting for Democracy are, are so critical is if we don't fundamentally find a way for there to be shared experiences really on the scale of, of millions of Americans um, that are cross partisan in nature, then we don't really have a hope of actually having any sort of any of those really difficult conversations. Um, and I guess the last thing that I would say is, and I'm sure people are familiar with this, um, but in 1838 in Springfield, Illinois, it was Lincoln himself who wrote, um, if destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. And as a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die by suicide. And I increasingly worry, as I think a lot of people do, that that's really, um, uh, you know, when we talk about doomsday scenario, what we're looking at for the United States, um, and I'm inclined to believe, again, this may be something people disagree with, but more than climate, even more than you know, US-China relations or anything like that, this is our biggest national security threat and threat to our country um, is fundamentally not being able to um, have conversations or, or preserve, preserve the essentially almost 250 year experiment that we're, we're living in. And Joe, let me ask you a, a follow-up question. You talked about the clear and present danger that majorities of Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives, um, see in people across the ideological spectrum. And at the end, you talked about our inability to engage with people who have different views. Um, do you see that belief in others who have different perspectives as a clear and present danger resulting from our inability to engage in constructive dialogue? In other words, is, con is our inability to engage across difference and inability to grapple with different perspectives the primary or one of the most significant causes of why we see people we disagree with as a clear and present danger? Yeah, I'm not going to pretend like I have the, the million dollar answer to that question. But I guess what I would say is that it seems like it's a self-perpetuating cycle, right? There's um, And there's plenty of research on this as well. I was reading recently um, Stephen Marsh's book, um, who's a, a Canadian social scientist who was writing about uh, basically dispatches from the American future of what are the sort of scenarios that could lead to a disillusion of the United States. Um, and he writes about how uh, when you're talking about actually reducing polarization or, um, you know, uh, pulling countries back together, it's much easier uh, to uh, basically implement things from a, a place basically of preventative medicine, if you will, where uh, while the society is relatively healthy, that you're taking proactive steps to actually have common national experiences or increased civic dialogue or whatever it may be. Um, and that once you actually get to this place, uh, which I think is increasingly where the United States is at, um, it's much more difficult to actually have something that's gonna be totally, um, you know, a one size fits all cure. Um, but yeah, I think I think to answer your question, I think it's certainly a factor. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that uh, one of the biggest signs of this for me, and um, this is even something that I spoke about, I think in like my high school commencement address is like, you know, um, I reflected on 9-11 and how in times of tragedy or whether it's an internal or external threat that the country has had, um, the response of the United States, in my view, um, historically has usually been one um, of being able to rally together. And even if it's been a fleeting sense of unity that there has been a time where people are, you know, in the case of the aftermath of 9-11 standing uh, arm in arm on the steps of the Capitol, um, you know, uh, you know, singing alongside one another um, and, and kind of the state of union. And I think what you see with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic or even some of the uh, threats that we increasingly have is that when there is something, whether it's internal or external, that's being lobbed at the United States, we're increasingly ill-equipped um, to, you know, actually be able to respond to that. So again, I think for, from my perspective, 
I guess, a couple of things I would say. Uh, obviously, I'm biased on this too, but um, I think that for people who are already, uh, you know, um, much farther along in their their life journeys, it's probably that much more difficult to uh, set anew um, a belief that America is totally going to recover. I've been very encouraged now turning off the doomsday hat uh, to see stats and polling that suggests that young people are much more hopeful and desiring of um, people who can bring the country together and unite them. Um, but I do really think that very practically speaking, what it's going to take and, and um, uh, what it's going to require is a massive recommitment of neighbors and communities and friends um, to living and serving alongside one another and having these really critical shared experiences. Um, and I certainly hope it doesn't take a war or something like that on a massive scale like we've seen in the past for America um, to have that sort of shared national purpose. Um, and quite frankly, I don't think that uh, where we're currently at, a war is actually the sort of thing that is going to bring people together. So I think it is peacetime national service type programs um, like the one that we're proposing um, that, again, if they can truly uh, go into the, the full bloodstream of the United States, um, have the greatest potential of creating this shared experience and shared sense of trust that then is the foundation for anything we might do together. Mm. Yeah, thanks so much, Joe, for, for amplifying on your, your strong message about the opportunity of shared experiences and national service, including adversity, when you gave that anecdote earlier about the foxhole, to bring us together. Um, and I, I want to just continue on this theme and, and offer you, Nicole, an opportunity to share your perspective on why ideological bridge building is so central to LFA's mission and values. And what are the ways that um, working across divides can strengthen our democracy? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so, you know, we we heard Joe talk, um, Joe Nail talk earlier about you know the kind of this, the big tent vision, and and um, we've just heard him talk about um, you know having a, sh a shared purpose. I think you know for for Lead for America we truly believe in, and see that in order to create that that um, that shared space um, for having these conversations that we need to one, learn how to be bridge builders and then do the bridge building. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of liken it as I was listening to Jonelle just talk, like I kind of liken it to like a te team building, like uh, you would do at an organization, like through, you know, at, at a company and it's, you know, but at a such, at a much um, more raw and uh, like vulnerable level, um, both individually and nationally. Um, and when we're talking about bridge building for peace, especially when it comes to the, the, our, our democracy and, and the state that we're in. Um, I, I also think that it's important to point out a couple of actually our other, our, our other core values that really help us um, frame how um, how we go about or, or, or wish to go about with our bridge building, which one is um, our, our one of our values is love of neighbor. And um, I I found this, you know, as, as I was, you know, researching Lead for America and, and um, you know, thinking about joining the team um, back back when I found this to be a really profound core value. Also, um, one obviously, you know, my the, the the bridge building aspect was a huge part of it, and then also just to to have that idea of the love of neighbor also being so central and integral to how we go about doing our work. Um, and so, you know, we, you know, and 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 for us, loving our, you know, loving your neighbor um, does not mean being in agreement with them, um, but you can have that love without a commitment, um, you know, w w without that, without that agreement necessary. Um, and so I think we really try to, to kind of uphold ourselves to that, to that idea of love of neighbor, um, and, and really, um, using that to help focus, um, our efforts and stitching our country really, you know, back together or, or, or kind of, um, strengthening that. And then the other, the other piece that I mentioned, before, right? Right. Just getting back to like service. So another one of our core values is service and sacrifice. And um, again, I think that service is a huge piece of you know we we've, we know Shanae and Joe are you know committed um, in their families to service um, through uh, military service, and um, we also know that there's an, another possibility, another avenue for folks to serve, um, whether it's like public service or also um, national service. Um, and so national service being programs like AmeriCorps and things like that. And so we really want to build up our fellows to be 
um, to be able to live out these core values, not just in their time and the fellowship with us, but beyond, uh, because we we truly believe that those that those core values of service and sacrifice and loving your neighbor are going to be key elements in being able to build those bridges. Um, and so, really, just uh, you know, I think this is a phenomenal group of um, an inspiring group of of people who've come together one, to create this Lead for America Fellowship and then to kind of reach beyond and, and start creating this Uniting for Democracy program um, in which people can be given the tools and the training and the coaching to be able to learn to be those bridge builders and to start taking that action within their communities um, is something that's really remarkable. Thanks so much, Nicole. And I can't help but think about Shanae when you describe a, a program that equips people with uh, skills and training and coaching to work across divides and then take action uh, with people who might have different lived experiences, different perspectives. Janae, as one of the architects of this program, you're in part drawing on your experience as a participant in the Uniting for Action America program, which started in the middle of the pandemic, September 2020, and wrapped up in March of last year. Now, of course, your your action leadership team member, program director, serve on the board of directors. How has the experience in that program, which is in many ways reflects the vision that Nicole has articulated for this Uniting for Democracy program, how did that experience shape what you hope this program can be? That Joe and just I, you know, had never imagined the trajectory of that experience and what it would prepare me for, or equip me for to be in this space. And one thing I just want to name is just the privilege, the privilege to serve. Not everyone has the privilege to serve. And because some folks like their basic needs still aren't being met, but how much of a privilege it is to have the ability to serve and whatever that means from something small to something large. I know we shared, you know, two big projects or two big wins of LFA uh, fellows, but even small wins, right? As we celebrate every little piece as a part of the change, right? I look at it is, a, it is gears. Like if you move the gear just one point, that's still an act of change and of, of, of activism. And so the program going through with Urban Rural Action back in 2020, it was really a call to action of how to really get involved in a different way. I truly believe in serving and as much as possible across all spectrums and looking at it through a, a lens of serving locally, as well as regionally, nationally, and even internationally. And I think it's so important to not only talk about bridge building, but how can you be that bridge? How can you be the conduit, right? And again, putting your place in a self of service where you are allowing people to bridge across you, across communities, across cultures, across institutions. When I think about grassroots work versus corporate work, that you're able to put your place in that position as a bridge of liaison to talk about a myriad of issues. I'm um, doing the program in 2020. We had folks talk about um, some of the things I mentioned today about misinformation, but also food justice, food insecurity. I'm um, also about racial discrimination. Social media was another hot point. Um, education and, and gender, and gender equality and gender inclusion. And so I think it's really important that this work that UR Action is doing, UFD is doing, and that is a bridge for so many topics and to bridge so many different people, experiences and stories. Um, that again, it's just being that bridge, that conduit to be able to take information to and from communities, um, to represent, to stand in front of, to, to be an ambassador and to uplift the stories. And so I believe that what I experienced in the UR Action program, I would want these, I want the fellows of UFD to have the same experiences technical difficulty, sorry about that, to have the same experiences, to breed that bridge, to deepen relationships, and to address issues that are not maybe comfortable or aren't or not, aren't normalized to talk about. So I really feel like normalizing conversations that are challenging to have, but are necessary to have as we continue to shape and to lead our country. Hmm. I love that, Shanae. Let me ask you a follow-up question. What, what are the types of uncomfortable conversations that maybe we sometimes don't feel comfortable or courageous enough to engage in that you think we as a country, and it goes back to Joe's initial thoughts on sort of a vision for what our country ought to be, but what are the uncomfortable conversations that you think we need to lean into? Joe, I think, you know, something that we didn't bring up today too was even like around environment, around environment and climate change or climate justice and environmental justice. Um, I think basic needs, again, like we talked about like food and food security. And I think issues are really important around voting. But I think, I mean, a piece of that is still just the education piece that not everyone still has access to education, right? Or when we talk about pay, that not everyone still has equal pay. I mean, especially, you know, further complicated or impacted with the COVID-19 or even health 
healthcare. I mean, I think there's still so much to talk about. There was much to talk about pre-COVID that we still have yet to address, but I think COVID has even amplified some other issues. You know, when I think about just as a, in my space as being a women and girls advocate, when I think about even, you know, potential areas of like domestic violence or abuse, right? For children and women, right? That these are conversations that still are on the books or policies and regulations, but they're difficult conversations to have. And I think to what people pointed out today in terms of trust and community, that people aren't necessarily able to share those stories if they're not in these areas or commu communities where they're able to build trust or trust that folks are talking to. And so I think there, I mean, there's a myriad of topics that can be explored depending on your interests or depending on the needs of that community. I know that some of the fellows um, that we're working with right now have even expressed interest of how do I find a community venture or do this work in my community, but I'm also interested in how it impacts other counties that don't even have a seat at the table right now and don't have access. And so I think when just talking fundamentally about is who's at the table, who's at the conversation and how do we get those people included in the conversation. And so, I mean, there's, like I said, I think we could probably have a whole different workshop about what are some different topics that ultimately, you know, threaten our democracy, right? Because I think democracy is being fueled or plays a part in education and healthcare and food and environment and gender and pay. I mean, it's everything. Um, it's not just the big D in terms of voting and rights, but I think it's the little D of having access across the board. Thanks, Janae. So I'd like to continue to encourage folks to chime in in the chat with questions that you would have for the panel. I'm going to pull from Benjamin's most recent comment on social media and the havoc it can create. The question for the panel would be, what are the ways that social media can strengthen or weaken our democracy? And are there ways that you would like to see U4D participants, Uniting for Democracy participants address the challenges that social media presents to our democracy. So anyone who would like to weigh in can jump in on that question. How does social media contribute to a stronger democracy how, or how does it weaken it? And are there ways that you would like to see participants in the United for Democracy program address some of the challenges that social media presents for our democracy? I, I I can jump in and then um, hopefully others will be able to add things as well. You know, I think one of the things that I see as a, a strength of social media is that it's an easy avenue for collective action, um, for people to, to um, learn about issues and to be connected with folks who are similarly passionate about those issues. I think that's also where things can unfortunately be easily twisted. But I think when we look at, at um, you know, the women's movement or people are organizing, um, you know, protests about things, that's often where people learn about them. That's how, that's where people know how to, if I'm going to show up and support something, social media is, is a way for that. You know, I, I think that this came up maybe in a conversation that we were having, Joe, the idea of like moderated, um, like chat rooms or moderated, um, like social media platforms. I think it would be interesting to see what that would look like if it was put into action. Um, but again, as a way for folks to be able to connect, but recognize that there is a certain level of respect that we want to have people, you know, if people are sharing things, but it's it's spreading misinformation or it's an article that that's not from a credible source. You know, maybe there's someone who in in a level of um, you know autonomy or, or authority is able to say, well, we don't really think that's productive. And let's let's kind of take that out of the out of the the fray, um, but I think that those are two things that I see maybe as a benefit of and, and potentially a solution that social media can provide. Thanks, Logan. Anyone else want to weigh in? Yeah, I'm happy to share here too. I think like to your point, Logan, it's a tricky one because I think social media has been that place where people are really able to exercise their freedom of speech and it's not monitored and they're able to kind of speak openly or transparently for the pros or the cons. I think um, when you talk about social media, I think the the tools or platforms of social media have just have have grown significantly in the past few years. I mean, from Facebook, from LinkedIn to Instagram, but even to platforms like Discord and others, they're allowing people just to or signal to have these conversations um, and they're not necessarily moderated. And so how do we balance, like, again, infringing on potential democracy or right, right, a freedom of speech, but also making sure that it's done in a useful or healthy way? And how do you do that? Um, there's been, like you said, Logan, a lot of positivity that came out even in 2019, 2020 
2020 uh, with like the Black Lives Matter movement and other movements that are really like where people are really pushing and actually making change. And when you think about, again, access that, you know, many Americans have access to a phone, but that may be like their only means of internet access on a phone. And that's their way of connecting a connectivity, right? Outside of being home and having to, not having Wi-Fi in those spaces. So I think that it can definitely be a very positive role. And I think things to explore or talk about is kind of when it's not used for positivity, right? And how can we maybe have an intervention around that of creating potentially regulations or just kind of, like you said, monitor spaces. Um, but I think there is an opportunity for invention there. And I think that also draws on a different skill set, um, again, of those of, of using education in a different way from a technology, from social media, from just these nuances of different skill sets that these new leaders are already equipped with because they are the digital age, that they are growing up with digital devices. And how do we get them to conversations about how do we create an intervention in these spaces? I think would be a great space to do that in this work with UFD. Thanks, Shanae. Nicole, did you want to jump in as well? Yeah, I would just add that, you know, I think, you know, social media, like in general, I think in its almost like altruistic form has the potential to be a, an incredible bridge building platform. Um, in practice, however, like we've all heard about, you know, echo chambers and like, you know, what how social media has, has you know, what in practice has, has become to, you know, what reality it has become. So, I mean, wouldn't it be cool though to have some social media platform that was with the purpose of bridge building? I mean, you know, let's disrupt the echo chamber problem and and actually get people to, you know, talking across lines of difference um, on social media. Um, but I think, you know, truly like there's nothing that's going to replace being able to be in conversation and in community and um, with people. And so I think, you know, that's, that's for me, that's the, the the real crux of it is that, you know, I think social media can be a tool, but it can't be the thing that we're relying on to, to, to build this vision. Which makes me excited about kicking off this Uniting for Democracy program in person in places like Salina, Kansas and Wadena, Minnesota and elsewhere, as opposed to relying on communicating over the internet. I, I want to lift up uh, Chip's question, but Joe, did you want to jump in before I do so? Oh, I mean, per usual, maybe I shouldn't offer my hot takes, but <laughs> I mean, I, I'm certainly of the opinion that social media uh, today, at least in the United States, I can't speak to other contexts, has done more harm than good. And something that we, I guess, haven't talked about is um, it's not like a lot of the features that we see of why social media is, is currently, in my view, a debilitating force for our country is a particular surprise when you place a business model of addiction at the center of how you build these companies and organizations, then I don't know how you expect to have a different result. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it would be one thing if if companies uh, or big tech, big tech in general, decided to place at, at you know top of its list of values or priorities, uh, you know, providing people not just viewpoints of people who they disagree with, but people who they may disagree with but have something in common with. Um, it would be different if uh, you know there weren't auto scroll and all these other sorts of things that are deliberately built just to be addictive in nature. But um, yeah, I mean, it's not just the fact that people are operating in echo chambers. It's also the psychological and physiological effects that we see of young people, especially young girls in our country, um, mm -hmm. of being addicted to and um, having really negative experiences on these platforms. And we don't even know what the longitudinal data will end up saying in terms of how negative this actually is. So um, I'm, I'm skeptical, um, but for serious regulation or changes that there's going to be a, a difference. And I'm always interested in hearing about ideas for alternative platforms. But at the same time, what is the likelihood or probability that we're going to create a new platform that's going to be able to compete realistically with some of these other platforms? In my view, the best thing that we can do is adapt and, and try to have the existing platforms reach their aspirational potential as compared to thinking that a nonprofit or fledgling um, enterprise without billions of dollars is going to, you know, rise to the same levels of adoption. Hmm. Yeah, thanks, Joe. So I want to lift up a, a question from Chip, both a comment and a question, which is that, again, we represent two different organizations that have chosen to work together in a really robust way, and that's a bit unusual. Chip is one of the leaders in the peace building field of working across silos, as he puts it. Um, working with, as he calls it, our first cousins and connecting the dots with organizations in adjacent fields like strengthening our democracy and advancing justice. And so the question he poses here is, how can we make this type of collaboration the norm? Anyone want to weigh in on that one? 
Yeah, I, I can jump in there. Um, you know, Chip, I think one of the things that I've learned um, being in the peace building world for, for probably like a year and a half now is that it's a, it's a very robust, but it's a very small community, right? Um, and, and tighten it, I would say. And I think that there is still power, and, and this is maybe a, a um, criticism of my generation, the unwillingness maybe to reach out like those cold calls or those cold emails. I think there still is benefit and power to that. Um, you know, I think it's one of the reasons that I'm able to speak with you here today. Um, Joe was certainly someone who reached out to me and invited me to be part of, you know, this organization. And I've been very grateful for that. I think there's still is benefit there. I think the other thing I would add is, at least that I've learned, is the flexibility of something. Um, you know, that if you have a vision for a program or something or a collaboration, um, that it is not a, a weakness to say, okay, let's readjust and let's change where we're at because we want to be able to better serve who we're hoping that this program is going to be for. Um, I think that that's something that I've been learning very quickly as well and recognizing where to adapt when you get a better sense too of these are the resources and skill sets that we have as two, two three, four organizations, um, or these are the skills and resources we have as a group of folks who are working together. So I think those are two of the things, or maybe that's three or four things that I would say um, that speak to your point there. But I, I would emphasize that I think there still is power and benefit to just reaching out. Um, I think the worst someone can say to you is no. Um, and once you get past that, um, there, there's the, the possibilities are endless. Yes, we need to overcome our fear of rejection. Carlin, did you want to jump in? Absolutely. I was going to say we had a workshop on that with Lead for America fellows, cold emails, <laughs> how, to, how to send in cold email, the technicalities and also how to deal with the rejection. Um, and especially during the pandemic, I mean, people are overwhelmed with just being on phone calls, being on Zoom calls, answering emails. Um, and it, that, it's definitely a big part of it. I would say another thing that I've um, witnessed in our partnership and, and things that I've seen fellows talk about too is um, when we talk about uh, cross silos, it's it's really uh, talking about putting our money and our energy and our decision making in where, where we want to collaborate. And I think that's a huge um, portion that we have to like consider and that people are when when they are reaching out and trying to work with one another um it's not just the the relationships between the person who reaches out and the person who uh is being reached out to but it's also the commitment then to walk together from that point forward and see something through together and that takes financial commitments that takes um time and energy um, and that takes a lot of relationship building too that i think uh it, it we see our fellows experience every day <laughs> it's a it's a lot of emotional labor too because it's about getting to know one another and being able to help push each other and build consensus forward um and that sometimes also takes the hard things of like putting our money behind what what we're what we're sharing putting our energy and time and making for sure that that's a priority of of being able to be collaborative as well thanks carlin uh, so we have about five minutes left for this rich conversation, and I want to give everyone an opportunity to weigh in on a final question, which is, what is one thing you might encourage everyone who's in this room listening to this conversation, including ourselves, to do to strengthen our democracy? It could be something that folks could do with our respective organizations, folks, uh, things that folks could do with uh, others in their community. But what is one call to action that people listening to this conversation might take away with them. I'll go to you, Shanae, first, and then we'll just sort of go around the room. Thank you. Um, I would say the two things that come to mind for me is reaching out to an organization that you just may know nothing about. Um, they just could be doing similar work. And to know that this work may not always be called peace building or may not always be called democracy building. But I think really looking at the mission statements and kind of what's in their mission and vision statement that, that resonates with you and thinking about where you have points of intersection. I think one word that we did bring up in the beginning was intersection and kind of how important that is about intersection. And I think another word that comes to mind with everything that's kind of been stated is just the use of the word intersectionality and understanding what that means and knowing that our collective freedom 
freedom or collective change lies within all of us to be a part of that. Um, and that would probably be like my major like call of action, right? Of just understanding that word and finding an organization that might be in this space of peace building and democracy building with, the, with a mission alignment. Excellent. Thanks, Janae. Carlin? Um, I've recently been really encouraged. Uh, we had a, a session on Wednesday with a photographer who went uh, across the nation and, and shot um, uh, as we kind of led up to our, our the, the 2020 election. And he was doing some very, very powerful storytelling. And just uh, his name is Jeremiah Ares, or Aries. I'll put it in the um, chat so that y'all can follow him. Um, the one thing that I would say uh, that he inspired me to do is to just reach out to strangers, like saying hello to people um, in our local communities. And another one of his projects was also about local media um, and supporting your local media. So I know Nicole talked about a lot of our, uh, what we talk about is about being place-based um, and really engaging with the community around you. And so I would say, say hello to someone that you might not normally say hello to. It's a very small action, but I, I think it could be really powerful um, and then also, uh, we'll plus one what Shanae is saying, like find those thing, those organizations that are near you um, and feel free to introduce yourself and if there's ways that you can help support. Excellent, thanks, Carolyn. Logan? Yeah, thanks so much, Joe. And thanks again to the rest of the panelists and, and the participants here today. Um, certainly been very encouraged by the conversation and to hear everyone's thoughts. I think I'm gonna piggyback off of what Carlin had shared too about one of the things I've really tried to do is continue to be an informed constituent. Um, and in fact, this week is the News Literacy Project's third annual National News Literacy Week. And so I think building on that idea of being an informed constituent is also about being able to discern what is good media and what is not. Um, and I think it's very easy when we are constantly flooded with so much news and information how to kind of weed through all of that. And so one of the things, you can call it a New Year's resolution, you can call it a, a, a mantra that I've been trying to implement this year is if I see an article heading that is interesting to me, I need to digest that article and read it myself before I just pass it on. Because I think that that's how, we, that's how we spread things that are potentially misleading. And that's something that I've, I've kind of set as my own goal. And I would say that as a call to action for everyone here today. Thanks, Logan. Joe? Sorry, I was just trying to find the mute button there. Um, yeah, I think my, uh, I guess, recommendation would be, well, I, going back to another um, thinker, writer who I really admire, Edmund Burke, um, he wrote about little platoons. Um, and basically these are the um, smaller groups or small scale human associations or groups that um, in his view, most command our affections and um, that are in a better position to do that because they're much closer to us than you know, state or federal institutions. And I think part of the breakdown, oh, looks like I'm pausing. We can hear you. Part of the breakdown, okay, just making sure. Part of the breakdown, I think, in American life is that uh, increasingly people are not members of little platoons where we've gotten really segmented and you can just focus on now today, uh, you know, being behind your screen all day, uh, being with your limited set of friends or family. So that's what I would say is like, uh, for each person to evaluate or try to find out what are the little platoons that are operating within your own neighborhood or community and commit to uh, becoming part of at least one of them. Thanks, Joe. Nicole? Thanks. I'd say um, one is encourage your network to apply for our fellowship. And two, um, if, you know, as professionals, maybe, maybe advanced in your career, hey, national service can still be for you. So uh, check out national service and AmeriCorps programs um their living allowances etc so serve and then um the third just practice vulnerability i'm a huge fan of storytelling and um, using storytelling as a powerful tool to uh to build bridges so start to practice that vulnerability awesome thanks nicole thank you first to our panel shanae carlin logan joe nicole thanks for sharing your insights your experiences your vision for our country Thank you to all of our participants for joining this conversation, contributing to the conversation in the chat with your thoughts and your questions. We hope you enjoyed the session and we would also encourage you if you'd like to share your email address in the chat so that we can stay connected. So um, please feel free to do that. And thanks again for contributing to an engaged session. Thanks everyone.